welcome. I'll do a short introduction and then uh, we'll have a, a nice discussion for 30, 45 minutes or so. Beethoven's string quartets are the mountain that uh, every string quartet wants to climb. And like Mount Everest, the quartets have victors and victims. But this week's quartets are very fine players, as we've just heard at this lunchtime concert, which has opened a cycle of all the string quartets. Uh, from Victoria, we have the Lafayette Quartet, with Joanna and Sharon representing them. From Auckland, we have the New Zealand String Quartet. Right? From Wellington, we have the New Zealand String Quartet, with Rolf and Helene. And from Waterloo, or is it Kitchener Waterloo? <laughs> from Waterloo, we have the Penderecki Quartet with Jeremy and Christine. So welcome. Uh, now, just continuing my metaphor, roped together, these three string quartets are going to uh, climb the mountain this week. And like all good adventurers, they're here to tell the tale about that. Um, Beethoven's life is usually divided into three sort of periods, early, middle, late, and late. Um, can someone just give me a quick capsule, sort of bird's eye view of where the quartets fit in and which quartets uh, belong to which periods? <laughs> all right. Happy to jump in. The, uh, the early quartets are the Opus 18 quartets, and that's when Beethoven still has a foot in the classical world. And uh, they, they sound a bit Haydn-esque and Mozart-like, but there's always that sort of devilish Beethoven quality, that's sort of revolutionary, that we'll, we'll get into. And then there are the middle quartets that are the Opus 59s, Opus 74, Opus 95, when Beethoven is exploring that, the whole genre of the string quartet. And it's, it reminds me of evolution in a way. It's like he's trying out new forms. The 59s are very orchestral. They're, they're long, almost an hour in length. So make sure you make it to the washroom before you hear those. <laughs> and then uh, 90, Opus uh, 74 is, is kind of unusual. It has two variation movements in it. Uh, Opus 95 is the Serioso, the shortest quartet he wrote. And that, that completes the middle group, middle quartets. And then it's the late quartet, starting with Opus 127. And that's when Beethoven really goes into this sublime, um, amazing, magical world that he sometimes revisited, revisits the Opus 18s and the middle quartets. There are elements of that, but there's something otherworldly and extremely sublime and, and as deep and, and personal as it gets. Mm -hmm. So it's 16 quartets altogether, 17 with the, uh, the Grosser Fugue, the, the, the great fugue. Um, we're now, what, 200 years after Beethoven wrote these quartets, um, and they're still a bestseller. <laughs> What's the appeal? What do you think the appeal is? I think that Beethoven is one of those individuals, rare individuals, who through turmoil, trial, tribulation, uh, between his uh, deafness, his indigestion, his orneriness, and his great compassion and passion, he was able to express really the gamut of human emotion. And I think each one of us in this room has had many, many moments when you say, oh, oh I know what he means, I, I understand that. And it's a, it's a kind of, I, I find it highly emotional spiritual music, and no matter what year it is or what time, it's, it's very pertinent to us in yeah. 2011. New Zealanders, do you want we, to? Uh, <laughs> just add to what um, Sharon just said. We've had some wonderful experiences playing for audiences who don't know anything about classical music. In New Zealand, you know, we could play for anybody. And um, um, <laughs> it's small enough, we can cover the country. And, um, uh, and one time we played uh, the slow movement of 132 for an audience that was really, it was the clients of a bank who was sponsoring us. And, and um, quite a lot of sort of general sort of rugby audience, I would say. And a guy came up to us after that concert and he said, you, you took me back to my childhood. I almost cried. Mm. And this is a man who probably didn't, had never heard a quartet before, but late Beethoven spoke directly to his heart. So I think that's what, that's what he does. Yeah. Anything to add, uh, Jeremy? Um, no, just, uh, I mean, I was thinking, uh, speaking of playing late Beethoven, unusual circumstances. We've, we've also played 
late Beethoven, we did the, um, the Cavatina on a China tour once, and we were told, supposedly, that string quartet, in certain parts, some of these cities, cities that I can't pronounce, but um, <laughs> that they never heard string quartets there. And, and, and it's sort of the privilege of feeling like you're, you're literally premiering late Beethoven to an audience is an incredible uh, privilege. Yes. And, um, and remarkable feeling. We felt, felt very, very differently on stage that night. Has your quartet had a special plan when you've been preparing a cycle or a, a sequence of the, the quartets? Have you had a strategy? Uh, you mean when we, when we uh, program a cycle? Yes. 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 Um, well, I'm sure we all have... Or when you did it for the first time, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, we look through the history of other quartets and their cycles, their orders, and we didn't like any of them. <laughs> the first decision is, it's, is it going to be in five concerts or six concerts? Do you repeat Opus 130 once in its entirety with the uh, Grosse Fugue and then with the finale so that one gets a sense of how different the weight is of the piece <laughs> with the two different endings? That's something maybe we'll get into. Yes. But um, we came up with a strategy that uh, when did one's way through the early middle and finally getting to the late towards the end of the series in six concerts. So we started mostly with the 18s um, and 59s and then in the middle uh, Opus 127 crept in with some of the middle quartets and then the last couple of concerts were only late quartets and the last concert was Opus 131 and Opus 130 with the gross of few not in the other order. But um, we thought by the, if people come to the whole series, they'll understand his personality so profoundly by then, they'll be ready for the surprises. But Beethoven will never prepare you for the surprise that he will specifically offer. You'll, you'll be prepared for a surprise, but he, he's so creative that he always will, will um, keep you alive and in the moment. And um, so I think this, this was a nice strategy because when we finally played 131 at, at the very end, we felt the whole audience who had come to all the concerts were with us spiritually, emotionally. Yes, so it, a real journey that you yeah. planned there. Yeah. Have you, has the Penderecki done a, a cycle of the Beethovens? Or not, not a cycle. Not as a we cycle. Played, we yeah. played them in, in just different contexts, but yes. not sort of sitting down one night after next to play the entire cycle. Yeah, and what about the Lafayette? Oh, you guys? We've done the cycle a few times, and we've done it um, sort of in our, on our home turf where we could spread it out over the season, and we pr approached it more like you do, would do a regular concert with a, starting with an early one um, and then going to the later ones on each program. But we've also done it away from home where we had to put it into four or five days and that's, that's a challenge, but mm -hmm. um, it, we did the same thing. We never, I mean, I think that's a great idea to do it that re retrospective way. I remember I saw an um, art exhibit of, um, well, several, but one in particular of Van Gogh, which was all early leading to the late, and it was quite moving in, in that way, too. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a, of a, a festival in uh, at Buffalo that, uh, the Buffalo Chamber of Music Series, which is one of the oldest, I think, mm. in, in, in North America. And we, we were to play three Beethovens. It was part of a Beethoven cycle concert. And we thought, we, we didn't like the order of how they asked us to play it. So we went out before the second piece and said, we'd like to change the order of the program. <laughs> we're gonna, I, I forgot which, what, what the pieces were exactly. It was 18, 6, and 95. It was 18, 6, and 95. We thought what we would uh, ch switch the order. And we had no idea what we had done. <laughs> because at the end of the concert, the presenter came Seriously. back and he was, he was pretty mad. He had a little fire in his eyes. He said, we've done it the same way for how many yeah. years. <laughs> and you don't change the order. And, yeah. and we had, and it was, you know, we were taking artistic license. But anyway, that's that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my. Well, with, with that sort of thing in mind, if, have you any experience you could 
or advice you could give to a young quartet starting out? I mean, I imagine it's a lifelong journey coming to terms with the Beethoven quartets, but from what you've learned so far, what would you pass on to a, a young quartet who are just sort of starting out, just beginning to sort of learn all those quartets and really want to do a cycle? And I can tell you three string quartets in that position right now. Well, I think that I would probably say play a lot of them, but wait to do the whole cycle. Like play them now and then come back to them. When we, when we um, were first all the four of us that are now in the quartet started to play together. Um, we knew that we were going to play a cycle five years down the road, and it was, that was fantastic, and, um, because then every year we did quite a lot of them. And so then when the five years had passed, we were, we were ready, and I wouldn't have wanted to do it one second earlier. Um, I was, we, did, we learned 127 as one of the first ones that we learned together, because we were all so scared of it. And so we, so we, um, um, we played it, and then we put it away. And then when we came back, we thought, you know, we could get in. And that's the great thing about great music is that every time you come back to it, it's got, you see more in it. You, you, certain things that were hard are not so hard, so you can go to the next level and, and you see the greatness just unfold and unfold. It's so wonderful to re-experience. If I was to ask you what you understand by the word Beethoven um, relative to the quartets, what, what kind of adjectives or uh, images would, would you, might you come up with? Yeah, Sharon. I'll use a word that our cellist Pam Haibaloni does, and she'll say, we need the Beethoven fiber. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's that kind of um, where the instrument sounds, you know, they, they intertwine and rub up against each other and make incredible harmonies, as all many other composers too. But it's that kind of, it's weightiness and at the same time, a comedian, a lightheartedness, but then there's the spirituality at the end in the, in the late quartets, and it's Beethoven is is just all encompassing. He's universal. That's actually one of our coaches used that word, universal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it has that kind of fiber and that kind of intimacy between the four voices, where you're communicating on a very deep level. Okay, compare that or contrast that with Mozartian. Uh, can anyone tackle that one? What is a quality that uh, Beethoven is unique? Well, if I may, I mean, certainly the feeling of just raw power is, or just connecting to a very deep and urgent passion. Mm. It's not that Mozart doesn't have the Sturm und Drang, but it's, it's, there's a, there's a, it's like getting close to violence at times. You think of the 95, you think of the, the, the power of that. It's frightening. I mean, there's, a, there's a certain point at the end of the first movement, which is so devastatingly dark. Mm -hmm. And that, mm. that, that's really, that I think is Beethoven character for me that not a lot of other composers are able to. It's also about setting it up too, because it, it's, it's, it's couched in, in, as you say, sort of uni universal uh, emotions and sublimeness but he, he sets it up, so he, he, he takes you to that edge, and then, yeah. then he takes you there, and that, that's Beethoven for me. Mm -hmm. I think one, one of the features <laughs> of Beethoven is um, his ability to use juxtaposition that we all grapple with, the juxtaposition of the banal and the sublime, of, of the, the sacred and almost the pagan, uh, country tunes and you know s sacred songs and all these um, surprises in the Opus 18s uh, almost make you you laugh are, are extending Haydn's jokes but to the point where you're you're almost slightly shattered but later on the juxtapositions all the surprises are for emotional effect and help you go much deeper uh, you'll have um, comedy just on the flip side of some of the most profound soulful writing and it's as if he's slapping you in the face mm. and saying oh don't be so sentimental or you're a human being you can't always be in this state come on snap out of it and then just as you snapped out of it he digs deeper in the other direction and this is um there was this um Wegler, one of his friends said he witnessed Beethoven's recitals, and Beethoven had a power like no other, not even Mozart or, 
or, or any of the players of the time to seduce people, to, to play with people's emotions when he improvised. And sometimes he would be playing something slowly and he would look at the people with tears in their eyes and he would just turn around and say, Oh, you sentimental idiots! <laughs> so I think that's, that personality is in his music always. Yeah. <laughs> So that, in a way, has asked, answered what, what I'm, I'm going to ask next. Is Somebody defined, and I've forgotten for the moment who it is, but I do know, but I've forgotten, uh, the string quartet playing as a discussion amongst friends. Whereas with Beethoven, it often strikes me as more of an argument amongst friends. Is, is that a reasonable way of summing it up? It sure feels like that in the Grosse Fugue. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe an argument, not not with friends, <laughs> so much. Well, one, the word that kept monkeying around in my mind while people were talking about Beethoven is uncompromising, and I think that there's a lot of ways in which he is uncompromising, and we also need to be, in a sense. And so that sets you up to be kind of strong with each other. But mm -hmm. the, it's that fiber that's in the music, it's that contrast within it. Um, uh, but it's also his way of writing. He, the sketches are endless that we have of Beethoven. Um, he, he would work for two weeks just to you know, fashion a four-bar theme. And if something didn't please him, he would throw it away. I mean, we all know young composers who have good ideas but who don't know how to edit. And, and it's so frustrating because you think, I wish you could make something. This could be great if you just stuck with it. And they're like, oh, it's fine. Take it, you know. I'm done now. But Beethoven, you know, the, the publisher had to rip the thing out of his hands and say, I'm publishing it now because we're, we're over time, you know? And, and so that uncompromising sense of what he wanted to say. Let me just pick up on that. Um, the Opus 18s, he did indeed spend a long time paving the way before he came, came out with those quartets. I mean, it's Opus 18, it's not Opus 1. Um, and there's probably a good reason for that. Can someone explain what that reason might be? I think it's a little bit uh, the way Brahms felt after Beethoven. You know, it's that same he was... The uh, tramp of giants. Absolutely. Yeah. He, was, he, he uh, really revered uh, Mozart and Haydn, and those were his teachers, and he, he studied their quartets, and, and he was intimidated by it. And so, you know, the, 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 the numerous sketches and reworking, and it, I'm sure it was never good enough. Still, in the, even the Opus 18, number one, there are the various versions of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think uh, he was af he was afraid. I mean, he wasn't like Brahms. Like they found, apparently, he threw away 20 quartets. Brahms did, yeah. which is tragic. Uh, but but I think I think Beethoven was uh, afraid, and he didn't quite have his voice. But my sense is that he found his voice, and then he just, well, my sense and all of our senses that uh, he he uh, blazed a new path. Mm -hmm. And Haydn stopped composing quartets. Yeah, yeah, that's right, right. <laughs> yeah. Who is he writing for with these Opus 18 quartets, his first quartets? I think every quartet he writes, he's writing because he has to get it out. He's mm -hmm. writing for himself. I don't think that, you know, maybe, maybe there's a quartet that's going to play it, but mm -hmm. I think every note he needs, he needs to say that. But one of the differences with the Opus 18 set is that they can be played by good amateurs. Whereas, you know, when we get to the middle period well, quartets... Well, I don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I bet we would all say that they're the hardest. Well, I mean, it's a little like Mozart and Haydn. Yeah. They can yeah. also be played by amateurs, but we, I, I'm sure we all agree they're the hardest repertoire of everything. <clears throat> because... Yeah. Now, that's interesting, because uh, if a work is not as well written... Uh, it's harder to play and harder to find an interpretation. Are you saying that that might be the case with the Opus 18s uh, as compared with the other, the late ones? I don't think that's... I, don't, I, I wouldn't You're not say going that. There. I would say that he's, <laughs> he's just always pushing the, pushing the edges of everything and he's got this classical f form and he's just straining at the edges and, 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 it's, and it's so transparent and obvious. The way that... Um, um, piano duo, duo people say the hardest thing is just that, you know, when you're playing with two pianos, that they have that one millis nanosecond when the notes have to start. When there's so many short notes in that perfection of, of togetherness and freedom has to happen, that's, that's the thing that's really hard. It, it's almost as if uh, Beethoven took everything that happened in the past 
and did the Opus 18s, and that's the top, and then he jumped off and went on to the yes. middle and, and late. Yeah. And in that way, they're, they're more complicated, more, more um, um, not confusing, but there's, they're not as straightforward, maybe, as, as some of the other ones. And he's, he's really pushing the envelope, I think, of the past before he moves on to the future. Yes. Well, let me phrase it this way, that a lot of amateur quartet players did buy his music, Mm -hmm. by his Opus 18s, whereas I think by the time of the Opus 59s, they weren't buying. <laughs> they were just too difficult. I mean, by the time we get to the middle quartets, the second violin part sometimes plays in fifth position. You know, that's a little Ooh. challenging. <laughs> <laughs> means higher on the fingerboard. <laughs> I think as we get older and have played the late quartets, we go back to the early ones and we see the latent potential in all of them that we're trying to realize. And there's just you can never be satisfied because you always see that everything can be more powerful, can be more effective, can be characterized more strongly, and, and that's the challenge. With the Opus 59 set, I think that's when Beethoven threw a hissy fit at his first violin, uh, and th this is something that you've had to live with ever since, isn't it? You're rich. Well, what do I care about your wretched violin when the spirit moves me? Okay. <laughs> Now, let's have some comment on uh, what Beethoven meant by that. <laughs> well, I think we've always thought of that as, as, as a, just a, a way of keeping us honest, you know, honest to the score and not, not, not being quick to make compromises or, um, you know, there's often in, in, the, um, <clears throat> in some of the more challenging sections, you're like, well, do we really have to do this Boeing? This Boeing would be so much easier if we did this, for example. Those kinds of issues come up, and we, I think we're always trying to not give in too quickly to those, those kinds of feelings. And I, I think that, that maybe is part yes. of that comment, just, just inspiring ourselves to be everything we can be as players. I think it also reflects, though, his defiance, that sort of revolutionary Beethoven and the, that uncompromising thing that, that he just, uh, he, didn't, he didn't care if you struggled with it. You know, work it out. He of. struggled with it, right? Why shouldn't we? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And I mean, sometimes you're playing a piece and it feels really awkward. And you think, gosh, I'm just not finding the right bowling. Okay, let me try it this way. You, you explore, you, you keep trying to find it, and especially over the years. And you realize that it's just inherently difficult. I think he intended for you to struggle he, he, he wasn't looking for it to be a, a, a nice walk in the park on a Sunday. He wanted you to struggle internally, emotionally, physically. It, and, then, and it expresses something. I think, I think audiences feel it, and certainly we feel it as we, as we journey through. It's wonderful. That's partly what I think I was getting at with the, uh, the, the argument among friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's, yeah. it's very much a, a, just a fight, isn't it, rather than a comfortable discussion where <laughs> everything's also, resolved. Um, after he recognized to the world through his Heiligenstadt Testament that he had to admit his loss of hearing, that he was going to go inward and not um, anymore be the social animal and the, the coquettish virtuosic superstar, but he was going to devote himself to composi composition. And we see from the Eroica Symphony the whole nature of his writing changed. And the Opus 59s got caught up in that whole new way of conceiving yes. music. Yeah. 